What about the dissemination of mycotoxins and its individual steps, which I will actually go, uh, discuss with you now step by step. <clears throat> it all starts with sampling, uh, proper sampling, how to take a representative sample, uh, followed by milling, homogenization, extracting the sample, usually with a mixture of water and, or, and organic solvent. Often the water is there <coughs> to make uh, the, uh, make, uh, the uh, commodity more accessible by kind of swelling of uh, this commodity uh, for uh, the subsequent uh, or simultaneous extraction using an organic solvent. <coughs> then you filter. Uh, usually cleanup is performed in order to remove interfering matrix components such as proteins, fats, carbohydrates and uh, then you have to prepare for the final determination. Uh, I'm mentioning this actually as a separate step because ev evaporating from large volumes of your extract to a smaller volume can also potentially result into a loss of your analyte for instance through absorption uh, to, uh, to, uh, adsorption uh, on your glass material and finally detection <coughs> uh, or separation like HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography followed by detection by UV <coughs> or MS whatsoever and finally uh, reporting the result. So what I'm going to do right now is within this analytical scheme for the determination of mycotoxin uh, discuss uh, with you the sampling and uh, the milling and homogenization, homogenization step briefly. Um, sampling for mycotoxins in food is always considered as the most critical step. Um, clearly, well, if, if there is a hot spot of, a, let's say, a peanut which contains a 500 microgram per kilogram aflatoxin P1 per kilogram uh, peanut, and you have a couple of other peanuts which are not contaminated at all and you pick the wrong one, uh, kind of non-representative, then you can get completely different results of uh, several hundred percent of differences. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you are running a lab like, like, like us, we can only provide some advice, but I'm simply not responsible for the sampling, neither do I have actually <coughs> an idea on what is the purpose of that analysis? Um, is this something where sampling was an issue or not? But nonetheless, I mean, particularly for control purpose, for importing uh, uh, imported grain and so forth, proper sampling is certainly of great importance. The distribution of mycotoxins in products can unfortunately be very heterogeneous. Uh, worst case example, or one of the worst case examples being aflatoxins in peanuts and figs. Uh, one of the best case uh, examples is uh, dioxinivalenol in wheat. So uh, hardly will you find any hotspots there, though it cannot be excluded. Still, there's a possibility of a heterogeneous distribution, but the likelihood for heterogeneity for fusarium toxins is much uh, less than uh, for aflatoxins. There's a new commission regulations, well, new under relative terms, that's the one which is still in place. Uh, 401 2006, uh, which lays down methods uh, of sampling uh, and analysis of the official control of levels of mycotoxins in food. That actually is not only dealing with analysis, with the determination step, it also deals with the sampling <coughs> prior to the analysis. Martin Spanier is uh, uh, well, well known, also works uh, in, in Rotterdam in an official um, uh, control laboratory. He was quoted saying that actually two in food inspectors would need half a working day uh, to sample only one container of just one ship and they have actually hundreds of incoming ships every day. Uh, so that's a challenge on how to find a proper way in performing proper sampling, obtaining a representative sample and not spending months or even years to sample uh, these, um, this, this ship or container. I also would like to point out in the first instance here that the variability uh, of uh, the mycotoxin contamination can be minimized through increasing the size of the sample. So the larger your sample is, the more representative. <coughs> and uh, also the subsample and by decreasing the particle size. So that is why uh, when we are being asked to provide us some advice how to treat, how to homogenize uh, the samples, as a rule of the thumb we say, well, Okay, it should be homogenized ideally to a grain size of 
less than 500 micrometers. Yeah? So that is <coughs> uh, one very important aspect. Um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Piselli, uh, she uh, performed a study uh, in uh, 2008, I think, uh, Scarlett Piselli, so that, that, that is the name I was uh, uh, looking for. She uh, checked the distribution of OTA in 26 tons uh, wheat um, in a truck. And uh, what is not uh, depicted here in detail is the value for dioxinivel and all, but the final figure uh, will come back later. Um, they performed LCMS-MS analysis of a a homogenized aggregate sample obtained from 100 incremental samples of 100 gram each, so uh, um, <coughs> amounting to a 10 kilogram aggregate sample from 26 tons of wheat. And in addition, they analyzed a 100 individual subsamples, so from every uh, single incremental samples taken from these 26 tons, every single sample was also analyzed. And to see actually, so when I'm, when, when I'm following this European Commission guideline and I take a 100 incremental samples to form one big aggregate samples, what is the variability of the individual toxins in these individual incremental samples? <coughs> to point out or to see whether homogenization is an issue or not. And clearly it is an issue for ochradoxin A. The results ranged from lower 0.2 um, nanogram per gram or microgram per kilogram to 8.6 nanogram per gram. So great variability uh, with a coefficient of variation of uh, 200%. So the results scattered around the mean of plus minus 200%, so that is uh, a sign for uh, <coughs> severe heterogeneity. On the other hand, they also checked for dioxinivel and all, and that actually kind of is a proof of what I've said before, that, uh, the, the, um, that the homogeneity of fusarium toxins is usually much better, uh, so uh, they had only a CV of 25% for dioxinivel and all. And that, suggested to grind the entire aggregate, so-called bulk sample, prior to subsampling, so the sample comminution uh, is even more crucial than the sampling itself. Not, not meaning or not, not wanting to leave as a major sampling is not important, but the grinding, the homogenization uh, uh, of uh, these incremental samples <coughs> after sampling is as important. And we have... Uh, uh, last year uh, participated uh, in a sampling workshop uh, which uh, uh, took place at the port of Rotterdam, <coughs> which is I think the second largest uh, port next to Singapore uh, at the World Mycotoxin Forum. It was quite interesting that actually a couple of months later there was the World Nutrition Forum by Biomin uh, in the largest port in Singapore. And that was like, the second largest port. You can see actually lots of containers here up, and uh, some of those also contain food commodities. <coughs> and uh, that actually sums up the uh, uh, results uh, obtained for a sampling of uh, consignment of ground nuts um, at uh, a warehouse uh, in, uh, in Rotterdam. So there were 18 tons of South African ground nuts to be sampled uh, and analyzed for aflatoxins. And uh, there is a regulation uh, for the um, introduction of food and feed from third countries and uh, also commission regulation uh, which controls uh, food and feed of non-animal origin. Uh, there is actually a, a required control which consists of a documentary check, identity check of the, uh, of the consignment, also a physical check including laboratory analysis. And the consignment is actually accompanied by an entry document and sometimes by a certificate of analysis, uh, all laid down here uh, in these regulations, together with uh, the regulation uh, I've mentioned before, 401 2006, uh, laying down the methods of sampling and analysis. And according to that protocol, 
uh, <coughs> the uh, sampling was performed and checked whether or not <coughs> these, uh, uh, the, the, these commodities, uh, this lot, uh, exceeds or does not exceed uh, the uh, maximum limit which uh, has been laid down by, um, by the regulators. Uh, there's actually a very important sentence here. Uh, if the analysis of two single random samples yields the same amount, in this case of aflatoxin B1, the consignment is either not contaminated or there has been a fraud. So this is actually the quote of the food inspector there which is kind of um, an eye-opener uh, on what issues we are dealing here with. And when we have got here uh, these regulations, we have a look at these regulations with the commodity. In this case, we've got groundnuts, peanuts or oil seeds, uh, apricot kernels, tree nuts. <coughs> and you can actually see lot weight or weight number of sub sublots, sublots uh, let's say, of 25 tons. Uh, you will have to take a number of incremental samples of 100. Similar to Biselli's uh, um, um, case before, they had 26 tons, 100 incremental samples <coughs> of, uh, um, of um, an aggregate uh, sample weight, in this case, uh, to be a 20 kilogram for groundnuts. So you've seen with Biselli's case uh, that was uh, um, for, for grains. And... Uh, uh, the number of incremental samples were in this case 200 gram, 100 times each. Uh, so the weight of the aggregate sample, so the <coughs> uh, accumulated uh, incremental samples is was 20 kilogram, which shall be mixed and divided into two equal laboratory samples of 10 kilogram before grinding, because grinding homogenization, homogenization is so important, as I've uh, mentioned before. Each lab sample of 10 kilograms shall be separately ground finely and mixed thoroughly. So how does do the analysis look like? Well, <coughs> it's just a couple of pictures, uh, also with Franz and Elsa and Heidi and myself. Uh, here you have all these containers with ground nuts uh, where uh, you can sample by uh, putting a stainless steel tube into these uh, sachets and uh, um, performing individual sampling. Uh, then you end up with uh, such pots, uh, do a weighing procedure, uh, you've got a certificate uh, of analysis, recovery uh, and uncertainty of the results is also given here. Uh, so that is all to be taken in, into concentration before final <coughs> uh, evaluation and assessment of these, uh, of these uh, samples. And uh, each of the two identical laboratory samples is treated in the same way in the laboratory. So actually what they perform is slurry mixing. So 10 kilograms of, of sample plus 10 liters of water is actually mixed in a slurry, uh, <coughs> a slurry con con container. Uh, we've got four identical portions uh, which are taken uh, of the hom homogenate. Uh, for analysis, for backup, for the owner of the consignment, in case of the owner of the consignment goes to court for the judge. So these are the four uh, identical portions we need here. And the consignment is released, found as appropriate, by kind of meeting the guidelines, uh, the regulations, if the content of aflatoxin B1 in both subsamples is smaller or equal by 4 microgram per kilogram if the carbo is intended for human consumption. And the question is kind of, so why would you release the concentration of uh, small or equal 4 microgram per kilogram if the regu like, re regulatory limit for aflatoxin B1 in ground nuts intended for direct human consumption is 2 microgram per kilogram? So that is the question. <coughs> and that can, be, uh, that can be clarified by looking at a very important aspect of sampling and um, regulatory control, uh, we have to take into consideration not only the recovery of the result, but uh, in, as a total, the, and the uncertainty of the measurement. So the an analytical result has to be reported as X plus minus U, which is the expanded measurement uncertainty for which we have got a confidence level of 95%. <coughs> And here, well, that's for 10 ppm, could also be the 4 ppm. So there is actually here a result which uh, less uncertainty above the limit, 
uh, result is above the limit, but limit within the uncertainty. Uh, and here we've got the result plus uncertainty below the limit. And the directive actually clearly states that a sample will be rejected only if it exceeds the maximum limit beyond reasonable doubt, taking into account the measurement uncertainty and the correction of the recovery. So we know, or the lab in Rotterdam, they knew that the relative expanded uncertainty for aflatoxin B1 is a 50%. <clears throat> so which means that if you have got a level of four microgram per kilogram, 50% of four microgram per, per kilogram is a two microgram per kilogram. So meaning that samples which contain lower or equal four microgram per kilogram aflatoxin B1 still fall within this two microgram per kilogram regulatory limit which has been set for aflatoxin B1 and therefore uh, uh, the maximum limit has not, uh, is not beyond any reasonable doubt and therefore shall not be rejected. It still can be used for human consumption. So that is a, that is a, a very important aspect. So meaning only in this case here uh, the maximum limit is indeed exceeded and the, uh, the, uh, the lot uh, will be rejected and sent back <coughs> to the owner.